Hello, so this is Miss Kyler again, and we're going to continue our lecture from when we talked about Wyatt with the Italian sonnet. Now we're going to talk about the sonnet some more, but focusing it more on um, Shakespeare, who is famous for the English or the Shakespearean sonnet. So here's an overview of William Shakespeare's life, some of the key points. An English poet, he was a playwright and an actor, widely regarded as the greatest writer in the English language and the world's preeminent dramatist. And really, the more you study William Shakespeare and his drama, the more you learn to appreciate how wonderful and how brilliant he really was. He is often called England's national poet and the bard of Avon, and that's because he was born and brought up in the Stratford upon the Avon. At the age of 18, he married Anne Hathaway, with whom he had three children, Susanna and his twins, Hamnet and Judith. Sometime between 1585 and 1592, he began a successful career in London as an actor, writer, and part owner of a playing company called the Lord Chamberlain's Men, later known as the King's Men. He appears to have retired to Stratford around 1613 at the age of 49, where he died only three years later. This poem is, is called Sonnet 130. So sonnets really didn't have titles, they had numbers, but today we refer to them mostly by their first line. So you notice that all of these poems, we're going to look at all these sonnets, basically their title is their first line. This one's called My Mistress's Eyes Are Nothing Like the Sun. Shakespeare does some pretty interesting things here. We're going to look at that and study that a little bit more. So the poem goes like this. My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far from far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, when then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses masked red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And I, and in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, she treads on the ground. And yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with faults compare. He's pretty interesting with this poem. First of all, again, let's revisit the idea about Italian sonnet and English sonnet and do a little comparison. So Italian sonnets, there's 14 lines. It's an iambic pentameter. There's two parts, the octave and the sestet. The octave presents the problem, question, or quandary. And the sestet presents the, the solution, answer, or resolution. Okay, let's look at the English sonnet. Again, 14 lines. All sonnets have 14 lines. Iambic pentameter. There are three, but then that are separated differently. There's three quatrains and a rhyming couplet, and the quatrains present a problem, a question, or a quandary, while the rhyming couplet presents the solution, answer, or resolution. Again, remember, between those two things is the volta, or the turn in the tone. Okay, so let's look at this a little bit more closely. First of all, we have the first quatrain, the second quatrain, and then the third quatrain. Quatrain, as you can see, one, two, three, four, it's a stanza of four lines. Now the last two lines, that's the rhyming couplet. And yet by heaven I think my love as rare as any she belied with faults compare. So there's two consecutive lines that rhyme. So this is an English sonnet. It's a Shakespearean sonnet. So if I ever asked you who's someone famous who used a Shakespearean sonnets, you'd automatically know Shakespeare. That's why they call them Shakespearean sonnets but also call them English sonnets. So in the three quatrains, they present the problem. The rhyming couplet presents the answer. Okay. Now let's look at something he's doing here has to do with a very important term called the blazon. So you see, most of the time when people use a blazon, they would use these really beautiful comparisons. Her hair is bright and yellow like the sun. Her eyes are like two sapphires. Her teeth sparkle like pearls. Her breath is the sweetest spring breeze. So all of these things comparing the, the features of the woman to something beautiful. It's a poetic device in which the poet uses a series of metaphors and similes to compare his love to the beautiful things in nature. The purpose of the blazon is to praise the perfection of the beloved's physical features. The Middle Ages and the Renaissance was the, the belief was held that outward beauty proclaimed moral goodness. Outward deformity proclaimed an evil nature. 
So again, if you've ever read Richard III, where he's a hunchback, right? Because he's a hunchback, we know he's evil because he looks ugly and scary. So that's a whole idea. But if, oh, look at her, she's blonde and blue-eyed and looks beautiful. She must be an angel. So it's these sort of, this concept that was very, very widely held. But Shakespeare's trying to defy that. He's trying to belie that prejudice. So he's saying the opposite of the usual blazon. He's doing it completely different. His mistress is not the stereotypical beloved one writes about in sonnets. Her eyes are nothing like the sun. Her lips are not coral. Her breasts are not snow. Instead, he says, my love for her is honest. I'm not using this fake cliche garbage because I see her as she really is, and yet I love her still, and my love for her is genuine. So you see how what he does, he just turns that right around, right on his top of his head, and says, look, you guys are being fake. You may think your love is beautiful, but you're just closing your eyes and saying words. I'm looking at her as she really is, and I love her for being a real woman.